Okay, it's just around one o'clock here, so I guess I'll start with the formalities and introduce myself. Hi, my name's Lars Peterson. Um, I work here at Google X. Um, I've worked here for the past five years. I do a lot of uh, modeling, design, detailing work. If you guys need any of that, we do that as a service. Um, but before I did that for 12 years, I worked at your friendly neighborhood reseller. Um, eventually as the training manager, so I not only taught SOLIDWORKS, but I taught people how to teach SOLIDWORKS, and I wrote tutorials and books and all sorts of stuff. And when they found out that I did that, Google said that'd be cool if you did it here. So I've been doing it here for a while, and it seems like you guys are appreciative. Um, it is a really quick course. Again, I used to teach this, and it takes five days to really get in depth. And since we work at Google at 10X, I said, that's great. How about you do it in an afternoon? I'm like, OK, you can get a running start at it in an afternoon. Probably not going to be really proficient, but you, at least you'll have an idea. And one of the nice things about SOLIDWORKS' interface is that once you sort of get the idea, it's really easy to guess yourself, guess your way through it, or even ask SOLIDWORKS, what is this thing asking me for? And it'll give you an answer. All right. Without uh, further ado, I guess I will get started here. So SOLIDWORKS is a Windows based program. So if you want to run it on anything like an Apple or anything like that, really not possible. You can virtual machine into a desktop is what typically people do. Uh, some people use boot camp and, and tricks like that. It is not, uh, SOLIDWORKS doesn't recommend you do that because you can have problems where you lose a license basically doing that if, if you can't get it back off of the boot camp. Um, so usually virtual machine is the safe way to go. That's what I recommend people to do. If they don't have a Windows machine. If you do have a Windows machine, well, then that's what you run SOLIDWORKS off of. So um, I just double clicked on it and it's starting up here. Let me uh, just talk a little bit about what SOLIDWORKS is. So you're in the class, the fundamentals. So we're gonna uh, be covering just the basics in here. My name is Lars Peterson. As I said before, if you guys have any SOLIDWORKS questions, I love simple SOLIDWORKS questions because I know the answers to them. Harder SOLIDWORKS questions take longer to get answers to. But if you have a simple one, PetersonL at Google.com, shoot me an email. Uh, I don't mind answering them because it doesn't take me much time to get you the answer. All right, SOLIDWORKS, you can see, just opened up on my screen. Um, it is Windows native. And what it is, as far as industry speak goes, is it's a parametric 3D solid model. It has feature-based design and associative files. That all sounds like a bunch of garbly gook. It kind of is, but hopefully in the next 10 minutes, you will know what all that means. OK, when I do open up SOLIDWORKS, it comes up with this welcome page. It shows me stuff I've been working on in the past folders I usually go to, things like that. You can turn this off if you don't want it, but I find it nice because I'm usually working on the same thing that I was working on yesterday. So why not, when I start up, see the last 10 things I've saved. So it works as a mechanical design uh, program. Um, and you basically you build models and then you can fit them together into an assembly, make sure that they fit together, that it does the types of things you want. When I'm talking about the types of things that you want, let me just quickly turn one of these to wireframe so you can see what's going on here. So you can have dynamic motion inside of SOLIDWORKS. Um, if you want to give the parts motion, things like that. Opening this one up. So when you do open up the file, you can have SOLIDWORKS check and see if the range of motion, if the things are going to run into each other when they start moving. Um, so you get basically a computer uh, simulation of your model in 3D. So you can do things. You can run tests. You can find out how heavy it is. You can even do things like simulation, find out if it's going to withstand the stress and strain that you're putting the part under. Any questions so far? I know I'm very, very simple part of it. Oops. 
wants me to save. Fine with that. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about SOLIDWORKS. When I'm creating a model, whether I'm doing the, you know, the rod, the crank, whatever, SOLIDWORKS models always start off with a 2D sketch. I think that's weird for a 3D program, but basically what you need to tell it is you need to give it a cross section or a footprint or what the basic shape of your part is. So you always start off on a 2D plane, just like it's a piece of paper or a whiteboard. Make sure that I can see it on the screen. And you draw a basic shape. To get the thing fully defined or so that you know, SOLIDWORKS knows exactly the shape it is and therefore a machinist or an inspector or somebody knows the exact shape of it is, is you need size, shape, and location on your sketch. I'm going to show you uh, in real time here on SOLIDWORKS that how to do this, but you've got an origin in each part, which is your 0, 0, 0 of X, Y, and Z. It's a good idea to start on that just so you know where the part is located in space. And then we're going to get into parametrics. So you guys have heard the word parameters before, right? That's all it is. It's just setting up rules for things. So I can make certain lines horizontal or vertical. I can make stuff parallel to each other or equal. You can put a perpendicular in there. And so with those, I can lock down this L shape. So those are your first parameters. They're called sketch relations. Whenever you draw something like an arc or a line, you can put a relation onto it so that it knows how it's supposed to behave when things change. The last type of parametric thing that you can put on here are parametric dimensions. So once I start locking all this down, When it comes time to make a change, I just need to change one of these dimensions. I know the thing's going to retain that L shape. It's just going to make, it, make a, uh, a size change instead of you know this end going wobbly or anything like that. So you do have to set it up correctly. And then you will get a part pretty easy. So let me take a step back and get all the way back to the basics. So. SOLIDWORKS as files. Hit new. And it'll bring up, if you've used SOLIDWORKS before, the templates that you use. You see that I can use different types of templates. If you are working with a group that already uses SOLIDWORKS, ask them where their templates are. Those hold information like the uh, precision, how many decimal places out you go, whether you're using millimeters or inches, whether you're using pounds or uh, kilograms. Things like that are set up in the template. You open up a part, you set up how you want it, you save it as a template, then you don't have to do it over again. So I'm going to open up a part file. See, there's three basic files, part, assembly, and drawing. A part is a single component. So I'm going to get started on this. Do you remember what I said you needed to start off with in this all works part? Yes, a sketch plane. So I need to draw a 2D sketch. If you take a look at the uh, graphics here, sorry about that. There we go. So you guys can see on both screens. Um, all right. The big area is the graphic screen. That's where we're actually going to see our 3D model come to life. The area along the left is something called the feature manager tree. Remember how I said this is feature-based? So everything I'm building, it's going to keep a, a history of my part. And anytime I want to make changes, I can go into that history and change each feature individually. The other thing that it brings me up are these planes. So I said, remember, you have to create a plane first, or you have to select a sketch plane. Notice when I highlight these in the feature manager tree, I can see them in the graphics area. It highlights blue in the feature manager tree, and it highlights blue in my graphics area. If I select on it, you've always got these little pop-ups. So if I want to show it permanently, now when I'm moving it around, that plane always stays up. This is Windows native, so if I hold Control Select, pick a bunch of things, I can pick a, a, a multiple selection. If I hold my Shift key, 
I can pick a group starting from the top, going all the way down, so I can show all of these. Here's what the SOLIDWORKS interface comes with when you first start a part. You've got the three planes, front, top, and right, and then that zero, zero, zero where they all meet, which is this origin right here. Um, also, whatever you can pick in the feature manager tree, typically you can do it in the graphics area too. You see, I can select on these things. I get the same pop-up choice and it just hides them. So those pop-up choices, they're good to look at because they're typically the most common things that people will do. If you don't see what you want to do, if you right click, it gives you a longer list of things to do. Still not long enough, this double arrow will expand it to show you everything you could possibly do with that selection. But I'm gonna hit this one right here. That, that is my sketch icon. And when I click on it, SOLIDWORKS has just opened a sketch. I'm what they call inside a sketch. How do I know that? If you look in the very top right-hand corner right here, this is called the confirmation corner. That comes up whenever you're inside a sketch. One of the biggest rookie maneuvers is people forget they're in a sketch. They try and put dimensions or relations, and SOLIDWORKS doesn't know what they're doing because they're not in the drawing program. So you want to look for that confirmation corner. There's two different options. This one is just a, uh, you know, a, a civilized exit where it saves all the changes you do. The red X, which you'll see in SOLIDWORKS a lot, is always your eject panic button. I didn't mean to change anything in this sketch. Anytime you hit the red X, it's like nothing happened. In fact, if I hit the red X right now, my sketch will just disappear because there's nothing in it. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go along this command manager. So we got the feature manager here, which shows me the history of the part. And we've got the command manager here, which is how I access all the tools inside SOLIDWORKS. SOLIDWORKS did start in the 90s, so it does have these cool pull-downs like you used to use a long time ago, but I never use it. I'm always using either on-screen or this command manager. In the past, if you guys have ever used CAD programs, a lot of times all the tools you want end up monopolizing the screen space, where you'll have toolbars for 3D, 2D measurements, all sorts of stuff ringing your screen. SOLIDWORKS was just like that until they brought this command manager up. What it is really is it's just a composite toolbar. Here's my 3D toolbar. Here's my 2D toolbar. If you want more or less, you just right click. Since I do sheet metal a lot, I have that tool up, but if you don't want it on there, you can take it off. You can even put in your own toolbar and make up whatever ones you want. If there's certain commands you do all the time, it's really easy to add them to it. All right, so I'm in a sketch again. I look at the confirmation corner. It started a sketch in my feature manager tree here. And it also, for my first sketch by default, SOLIDWORKS takes you looking normal too, which is basically you're looking straight perpendicularly down on this thing. So as you're drawing shapes, it's true size and shape. If you were off kilter a little, that would not be the case. So it brings you looking straight down to it and starts you off with the command manager on sketch tools. I'm going to do this example right here, that L shape that I was doing. So I'm going to select a line. Again, it's always a good practice to, if not start off on the origin, to at least measure to it. So I'm going to start off on the origin. When I hovered over it, going so fast here, sorry. When I start my line tool, I'm looking, it's asking me to put in my first endpoint. I know that I'm drawing a line because my cursor's turned into a little pencil with a line next to it. You'll see as I hover near the origin, I'll get these little marks. Those are letting me know that I'm horizontal or vertical with where the origin is. But notice the mark is a little white symbol that pops up next to my cursor. If you see that symbol turn yellow, that means it's permanently going to put that relation on there. So I talked about sketch relations. By clicking there, I know that the end point is locked to the origin. You want to watch your cursor while you're moving it because on my second click before I do it, I'm going to wait till it gets that horizontal symbol so I know that line is horizontal. Many SOLIDWORKS users were once upon a time AutoCAD users, so it's got the same sort of AutoCAD method where you can click and click and keep starting a new line. If you want to stop drawing lines, you double click or hit the escape key. 
The escape key is always the ejection button out of a tool. So you can click and make point, 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 and then double click to stop. Um, another way, the original SOLIDWORKS way and the way that I'm used to doing it, is you, if you just click and drag, I'm holding my mouse button down. When I release the mouse button, it finishes drawing that line and doesn't have that little tail hanging off of it like you get with the other method. Okay, I only put a couple of sketch relations on this. SOLIDWORKS, when it's out of the box, has your sketch relations showing. Uh, typically, I turn it off just because once you get a really complex sketch, you see more relations than you do sketch. So on this one, it's pretty simple. I'll just leave it on. But you can see all I've got right now is I've locked one endpoint to the origin, and I've got a horizontal line. If you select an entity in the graphics area, this is called the property manager. Different from this one, feature manager, property manager. When you're in a property manager, you're setting the properties for whatever you just selected. So I'm setting the properties for this line, and hey, I can fix it in space, I can make it horizontal, or I can make it vertical. There we go. You don't always have to go into the property manager to do that. I talked about those pop-ups. They've got a lot of them. So I can click this, and you'll see that I can set that. But look what's happening to my geometry. It's going all kinds of crazy. The thing with SOLIDWORKS is if a item is underdefined, it will be blue, which is what this is. And you'll see the blue stuff, I'm able to move around really easily. This black one, I cannot move this up or down because it's locked to the origin and it's a horizontal line. The only thing that I have freedom to do is how long it is. So, okay, I can do a single select on an entity inside of a sketch and add a relation. You can also multiple select things. I showed you, you can hold your control key down to pick a bunch of things. You can also do box selections. If I were to draw a box like this, notice I'm starting on the left and going to the right. The box will appear blue when you do that. And what that means is anything totally inside of it will be picked. So you see I'm touching four lines, but I'll only pick these two. I get a whole different set of relations that I'm able to put here because now I'm relating one line to another. When you just have a single line, is it horizontal, is it vertical, are you fixing it? You pick more than one thing, like you pick an arc, you pick a line, it'll say you can make them tangent. You pick two circles, you can make them concentric, those types of things. It's looking at what you selected and giving you all the relations that you can do with that selection. The other way to pick, if I start from the right and go the other direction, is you see that it's green. Anything touching that box gets selected. So I can make that parallel. One more. I'm going to hold that control key down. One and two. When you release the control key, it knows you're finished with your selections, and then it'll put you whatever is up there. I'll make these two equal to each other. And now I've got this L shape. Yes, sir. Okay, so his question was, um, it, it was pretty easy for me to put a parallel on because my horizontal line was locked to the origin, and, and how did it know if, if that wasn't locked to the hor origin, what would happen? The horizontal would stay, so that other line would be parallel to horizontal, wherever it is. It's, it's, well, horizontal is, a, is an absolute. Right. I'm saying if the horizontal constraint wasn't on that line. Oh, yeah. If the horizontal constraint wasn't on that line, it would be parallel to it. It's usually the one that you pick first. The second one goes to it. I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. But that's it. It has to do with the order. The first one you select is going to be there, and then the other one's going to be related to it. All right. So I've got a location, and I've got a shape at this point, but I do not have a size. And that's where we come up with Smart dimensions. You always have to be cautious when anything's named smart. How smart is it? Um, why it's a smart dimension is other CADs, sometimes you have to say this is going to be an angular dimension. It's going to be a radial dimension. It's going to be a linear dimension. You don't have to tell SOLIDWORKS that. Whatever you pick, it figures out, oh, it's a line. It's a linear. Oh, it's an arc. I'll put in a radius. So that's why it's smart dimensions. You just have one dimensioning tool 
and it'll figure out by your selection what you're after. So if I were to put a dimension in here, it changed the size of my model. For your very first dimension, that shape that you've got gets scaled um, proportionally. So whatever number that was, you know, I just drew it freehand. That could have been 750 millimeters. But when I say 75, the whole thing shrinks down to that proportional where that is 75. Okay, put in another one. So you can see that as I'm doing this, the color is changing. When things are black, that means that they're fully defined. I've put on enough relations or dimensions so that it knows exactly where everything's supposed to be. But if you take a look, it might be hard to see on this screen, but that very last line here is blue. I never gave it a length on how long this horizontal line is. So I'm going to put in a dimension. Oh. And again, I can type in a number if I'd like. Um, you can also, if you need to edit it, you just double click on it. You've got this little slider here where you can see how things will grow. You can also do it incrementally. Or you can even write equations. There's two different ways to do an equation. You can do it just like a calculator, where if I want to say this is 75 times 2, it'll figure that out. But it doesn't always do the calculation. It just figures it out once, and then when I double-click on it, that number is no longer 75 times 2. It's 150. It just gives you the sum. You can do all sorts of things. You can type in pi. You can put in parentheses. You can do cosines, all kinds of stuff inside the modify box. It works just like a calculator. If I do want it to be permanent and maybe related to something else in the part, you can give your part some intelligence. I can say that it is equal to this dimension times two. When you do something like that, you'll see a little sigma appear next to the dimension to let other people know that that is driven by something else. When I double click on it, I don't get the ability to type in a number here. It's driven by that. If I turn off the equation, I can overwrite it. But right now, it's stuck to being proportional to this one. When I change it, when it rebuilds, hey, get back here. Try that again. There we go. I wanted to, to read out the dimension name when I do that. So there we go. It was still just solving 75 times 2 for me. If you type in an equal, that permanently makes it solve that equation. But if you click on a dimension anywhere on the screen, it'll add the dimension to it. And now you get a proportional where one changes, the other changes. So you start to get some intelligence just inside of the 2D level. All right, it's fully defined, got a 2D sketch. Any questions so far? Pretty basic stuff. Um, don't worry if you were hoping to follow along. I do have a part where I go slower and you guys can follow along. All right, I'm finished with my 2D. Once you've got that 2D sketch completed, it's time to move into the third dimension. So what I've done is I've clicked over on this tab up along the top on your command manager onto the features tab. The features tab is three-dimensional elements. Sketch one is two-dimensional elements. So done with my 2D, I want to turn that thing into a 3D. You'll see that SOLIDWORKS is context sensitive, meaning it's only showing you the commands that make any sense. I can't cut any holes or fill in any edges because I don't have any solid to do anything with. So it's only showing me the three basics. We're not going to cover sweep. That's a little bit uh, more advanced than we're doing today. A sweep is when you're doing like a cable or something. You run a circle down a path. It makes a shape like that. The typical simple solids are either revolved or extruded. So what a revolve does for you, it's for a turned part, like something you're going to put on a lathe. Um, if you pick an edge, it'll revolve around that edge. Um, if, you, if I needed to do like a hub or something like that, if I put a center line in here and rotate it by the center line, it'll give me a hollow cylinder in the middle. 
Also notice that it's okay as long as it's able to spin around without hitting itself. So all of those edges will work. But once I go into the interior edges, my display disappears because it starts to run into itself as it's spinning around that axis, gets confused if it's supposed to be adding or removing material, so it doesn't even try. But if you see a preview, you should get a warm, fuzzy feeling. Okay, I talked about how SOLIDWORKS is easy for you to guess through. Everything has a property manager. Whenever you get into a feature, it's got a property. The one that's highlighted blue is asking for information. In this case, it was asking for an axis before it did anything. If you have no idea what it's asking for or what any of these settings do, every property manager has a question mark. It takes you to the help page for that property manager. So these are all the check boxes that I'm looking at. So again, it's one of these, one of the programs that you can guess your way through in the middle of the night without having to ask people questions. Yes. Oh, no, it's highlighted blue just because I selected it. Um, her question was, how come this line is blue, right? No, they're fully defined. It's only turning the eye color when I select it. So you see, this one's black. If I have, uh, if I have nothing selected, they're all black. Yeah, it, it's just when I select on one of them, anything you highlight turns blue. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so her question is, how come, how come this is fully defined when I don't have a height on this end? Um, because I set these to equal. You see that when I do pick a, or hover over a relation, watch in the top right-hand corner, when I hover over this equal, it's equal to that one. When I was putting on relations, I put on horizontal, vertical, I did a parallel, perpendicular, as well as an equal on both ends. So the thing's always going to have a uniform thickness. Um, that, that answer your question? OK. OK, the international I don't want to do this is red X. Sorry, didn't mean to, to revolve. I actually wanted to extrude. So what extrusion does for you is it brings out the solid in the Z direction. So it's going to be perpendicular to your sketch plane by default. And I can give it a depth. like so. Again, I can type in 75 divided by 2, cosine, whatever. I can type in whatever I want into that line. It'll do the math for me. The other thing when you're in a property manager like this is the end condition. By default, it's going to be set to blind, which means it's just extruding Z that way. If I want to go Z the other way, that's what this toggle up here does for me. But there's a pull down here where I actually have more options. I can do this mid plane as well, and then I know that my right plane is running right through the middle of my part. Sometimes that's handy for when you're mating it to other parts and things like that. So they give you these other things called end conditions. All right, and this is my first solid. Let's see, I've got a boss extrude here. Uh, I like what they did. This is a, one of the groups that I work with. On their template, they made it so that if you don't do a material, it has this horrible checkerboard color until you do assign material, because people often forget to assign materials. And this is where we really get into the magic of the um, SOLIDWORKS 3D, because we've got our 2D shape, right? And then all we're doing is we're just giving it a depth Here we go. Something like that. Bring it out into that third dimension. Okay. But we covered parametrics. We're just getting into 3D. Here's the last part of that. Solid modeling. Okay. When 3D CAD first started out with Autodesk, they did this kind of thing where it was just a wireframe. It was just lines connecting X, Y, and Z points. But there was nothing in the middle of that. It was just a hollow thing. Later on, they came up with the idea of, well, we could 
it's like a bird cage. If we throw a cover over the bird cage, now all of a sudden we can see what the shape is, but the computer still thought of it as hollow. It wasn't until a company called PTC came along and started this solid modeling. Um, SolidWorks is kind of an offshoot of that. It's a direct competitor. Pro you've probably heard of. They were the first ones to come up with this idea. But what it is is that instead of it thinking of it as a um, it thinks of it actually as solid material in there. So there is a volume that it calculates. What that means to me is that if I go in here and I make this thing out of brass, not, is it, not only is it a pretty yellow color now, but I can go into the evaluate and I can ask, how heavy is this thing? That little purple dot, that's the center of mass. It's also giving me moments of inertia in case this thing's going to be spinning at velocity and I need to do calculations. You can save this, print it out. Also, you can reset the options. Because I'm in a millimeter part, which is typically what we work here in Google, it's showing me grams, which as an American, I'm terrible at that. Uh, I can do kilograms for some reason, but grams are beyond me. In fact, instead of kilograms, I'd rather you told me how many pounds it was. So you can override on your things and get an idea of 3.75 pounds. Way too heavy for what I want. Okay, well, how about we make it out of aluminum? Got the same center of mass, but now it's only 1.83 pounds. So with this solid geometry, you get a lot more information where you can start finding out if things are top heavy, if they're centered. Um, it goes beyond that. You can take that enclosed volume and break it down into millions of little triangles and test those triangles for stress and strain, see if the part's strong enough. So once we went into solid design, it really opened the doors to a lot more stuff beyond just you know 3D drafting. Yeah, yeah. SolidWorks, uh, his question was, can you, you know, the types of analysis. Uh, the, the version we have has a, like a stress and strain FEA in it already, but there are higher levels. You can get electronics, cooling, uh, uh, CFD, um, all kinds of things. The higher math that it requires, the more money it costs to buy that product. But they have a whole suite of them, uh, depending on what you want to do. Electromagnetic, I think you had said, too, it does all that. Yeah, definitely heat transfer as well. So it's a little rough uh, if the things aren't touching each other. Um, but if you've got if you've got stuff stacked on, you can see how the heat goes through that. Once it once it has to go through the air and then hit another part, um, gets a little out there. And there is software that'll do that, but not from SolidWorks. Okay, where am I? Okay, you guys all up with what parametric 3D solid modeling is? Not so much buzzwords anymore, it's a thing, see? We use it all the time. Okay, the next thing on my list is feature-based design. Right now I just have a single feature. What SolidWorks allows you to do is build feature on top of feature. So if I want to drill a hole in this thing, I can sketch on this face. And this time, I'll draw a center line. What's the difference between a center line and a line? The only difference is this checkbox right here for construction. See, I can toggle it off, off and on, regular line to a center line. It doesn't mean it's in the center. What it means is that SOLIDWORKS is going to ignore it. When it comes time to extrude or cut, construction geometry is ignored. It's only the solid geometry, that, the solid sketch geometry that gets turned into a feature. So I'm going to hit the center of that line. Put in a dimension, you see, put in a diameter dimension because it's smart dimensions. And I'm gonna cut this thing into the part. This is always set to whatever your last extrusion depth was. So good enough, I want it to be 75. What do you know, there's a hole there, there's a hole there. But of course, somebody wants to make a change. We wanna make this thing a little thinner, we wanna make it a little wider. Changes are easy. If you double click on a, on a face inside of the graphics area, it highlights what feature it is and it brings up all the dimensions. Same thing if I do it in the feature manager tree. Highlights it blue, shows me what the dimensions are. The difference in color when you're talking about dimensions is no longer underdefined or fully defined. 
obviously they're fully defined. They are numbers. The black dimensions are coming from the sketch. The blue dimension is coming from the extrusion. So that's my extrusion depth. I want to make this thing a little wider. If I want to change the hole, I double click on a face of that, or I can double click the feature inside the feature manager as well. Nothing has happened. Why, didn't you change them? I did change them, but if you look at the feature manager tree right now, you see those little stop lights? Those are letting me know that a change has happened in those features, but it has yet to apply the change. There's a matching stoplight right here. So I can hit it, it just goes through your tree, finds all the things that change and updates them. Um, it allows you to, so you don't sort of pull the rug out from underneath stuff, you're making something shorter and there's a feature on top of it. You can save all the uh, solving until the end. You can also solve them one at a time as you're going through the feature, but just to let you know that just because you change that number, it doesn't automatically change right away. Okay, does anybody know where I might have just run into a problem with this design? He's right, the cut's not going all the way through, so he must have used SolidWorks before because he's not even looking at it. If I, if I wanna rotate this thing, I just press the middle mouse button, or you can use the arrow keys. There's no hole on that side. Remember when I drilled the hole, it was 75. Still is. I never told it to change. So in your feature manager tree, if you want to make changes to a sketch, you can click. Anytime you see a pencil that's editing that information, or in this case, I'm going to edit the feature. I change it to through all. It doesn't matter if it's an inch thick or a mile thick. The thing's going to go all the way through it. Uh, you do have to remember that if there's a gap and then there's more model, it still keeps going. It goes until it doesn't have anything to cut anymore. So you do want to be aware of that. If it is one of those things where you just want to go through a single wall, that end condition is called up to next, where it just goes. Once it hit air, it stops. Could you drive that by the extruded depth of the, uh, the extruded cross space as well? I certainly could. Remember how I was able to do that sort of stuff with an equation inside of the sketch level? Um, if this was a blind depth and therefore had a dimension, I could set this equal to that. So you can't go across them like that. Yeah. So, so you, you can even go across parts in an assembly. That's not always the best thing because you can get confused as to where the information is coming from. But in a part, definitely you can say, hey, this thing's as deep as this cut or a third of this cut, whatever you want to do with an equation. It doesn't have to be just in a single feature. You can go feature to feature. The same effect, could you also say that there's a, a relation that the end of that through hole is the same as the face on the other side of the extrusion? Yeah, there's all sorts of different end conditions we've got here. If it's up to a particular surface, like what you're saying, I can say that's the surface I want you to stop at. Um, it's really handy, especially if it's a if it's a really strange surface, is it'll calculate exactly where that surface is for you. Yeah, okay, so these are. Sine wave shape thing, and uh, would it stop when the cut? No, it'll go all the way to the surface. It'll conform exactly to the surface. So it doesn't hit the first part of the surface and stop. It conforms exactly to it, but it doesn't go past it. Okay, these first two features that I've put in are called sketch-based features. Anybody guess why? Exactly, because I had to draw a sketch. So this group over here, this is the sketch-based features that create material. This group over here, sketch-based features that remove material. These other ones are called applied features. You do not need to do a sketch. So if I want to do a fillet, put in the value that you want your fillet to be, and SOLIDWORKS will figure out if it's a fillet or a round by the surrounding geometry. So see it remove material in one spot, added material in the other. It'll figure out, oh, that edge, I would put material in here to get that radius. Also, if you pick a face, hey now, come here. If you pick a face, it'll hit every edge on that face. Notice how it climbed up the corner here. By default, it's got this tangent propagation. 
where it'll, if it if it runs into a tangency, it'll just keep going around every edge. It's a good thing for knocking off the corner around the whole part. Okay, but here is my feature manager tree. So I can see you know, what features I did when. If I need to edit them, I go into either the features or the sketches, and that's how I can make changes to my model. Any questions on parametric 3D solid modeling, feature-based parts? It's best to always fall the socks. I guess start with the sketch and then move to your feature. Uh, is there really any other way to move through that workflow, or is it always going to be the sketch feature the additional like of filling in? OK, so his question was, uh, is there any kind of best practice as to which features you do in what order? Um, my finding is that you always want to do the solid first and then cut the holes and then at the last start putting in like uh, fillets. If the fillet is a major portion of the design, you can put it in up at the top, but it's usually a good idea for fillets like this where it's just for safe handling. If I put it at the bottom, I could turn it off for a simplified version. Um, a lot of times when you're doing analysis or if you have a large assembly, those fillets will kill you because it's a lot of geometry it has to draw that doesn't really do anything. I mean, it does something if you're trying to pick it up and you don't want to cut your sweater, but for the model, it doesn't really matter that much whether those fillets are on or off. So for what they call cosmetic features, I'll usually put those at the end. The reason I like to do the solid before the cuts is if you do a solid and then you do a cut and then you do another solid, that solid might fill in an area of that cut. So it's a good idea to like sort of build the sculpture first and then start drilling holes in it at the end and then finally put on uh, fillets. You know, it's, it's arguable that all of this stuff on this is last, because a lot of times with stuff like draft, it's a good idea to put the draft in early if you have a cast part or an injection molded part, because um, it's really hard to do it at the end. <laughs> um, but besides that, that- You would put a shell on that before putting fillet on, carry over, like doesn't the fillet have to go down and then it's kind of- Okay, that's an excellent question. Shell is very important. Uh, so if I was going to shell this thing, so he asked, uh, you know, is, is when you're going to shell it, is that important? And absolutely it is. Because you see that if I shell this thing right now, did you want that to have a wall around it? If you did, that's fine. If you didn't, you probably should have put it up here. and the fillets also up here. So you see that I can actually change the order that things happen in the feature manager tree as well. Um, but definitely shell really depends on where you place it. Did you really wanna shell this right now? Do you want that to have a hollow wall? You'll see it right when you do it, whether you should have done it before or not. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice fix. Okay, and if you ever want to get rid of anything, you can just uh, delete the feature. Um, this thing. Oh, I know what the problem is. See, this thing's giving me an error. Uh, the edge that I used in this sketch was before that fillet happened, so it's just a matter of reordering it. Or... Or if I needed to, I could have edited the sketch and changed where that end point was, but that was why it was giving me an error. It was like, hey, you used to use this edge and that edge isn't there when you fill it them away. Okay. Also, you notice that when it did give me that error, it was a nice little yellow one. It still made the, the feature. When you get an error like that, it still tries its best to do it. If you get a red dot on your feature, it's not even trying to build it because it has no idea what you're after. But here, it was like, well, I'm still gonna build it, but you've got an issue here just to let me know. Does it usually clearly identify what the problem might be? Because I didn't read what the little yellow error said. Yeah, well, when, I, when I've got an error like this, if I click over it, it says, warning, the sketch contains. Um, I usually don't go much further than that. I'm just, oh, this error has to do with the sketch. And I'll go in and edit the sketch. And right away, bonk, that brown thing is what I've got to fix. Um, so it does. When you hover over it, over anything with an error or ask it what's wrong, it'll give you a detailed issue of what it thinks you need to do. 
So it's telling me I've got dimensions or relations that are to something that's not there anymore. Um, they're a little generic. A lot of times they're like low oil lights where you're like, oh, or check engine light type of thing where it's like, that doesn't really help me. You just know there's a problem. Um, and again, sometimes you don't even really need to fix it. Sometimes it might just be an order of operations type deal. Okay, these are all great questions. I'm gonna move on here and I'm gonna save this part. Part naming is important. Do not name things, gear, plate, cover, lid, no. The thing is, is that SOLIDWORKS doesn't really care about what's inside the file, it's just looking for a name. So the first place it checks in, is in RAM. If I have an assembly open with something called plate and I open up another assembly and it's got the part called plate, it doesn't open two plates at the same time. It just uses that first one. Even if it's from a different folder, it doesn't care. It's like, hey, part's called plate, boom. So what do you do? The best thing you can do is give it a part number because um, that's why we give stuff part numbers so you don't duplicate it. But if you don't have time to get a part number or something like that, a date code is nice. Initials, uh, the name of whatever project you're working on, something that is identifying it that this plate is for something specific. Once you've given it a specific name, you're not going to have that mix up with it grabbing the wrong plate out of it. Also, that doesn't necessarily have to be what ends up, you know, in your bill of materials listing out. You've also got a description. So that is what I can have listed on my title block, in my bill of materials, whatever, as well as whatever the file name is. Typically, uh, we like to use part numbers in there, but um, if you're in a project or you're the only person working on it, do you really need a part number? Okay, so I have saved this part. That is uh, the basics on part modeling. I wanted to go over the other two types of files here quickly. So you'll see that I can do new and start off a brand new file. Or with this one, I can start one of those other two file types. I told you there's three types. There's a part, which is the component I just made. There's also a drawing. If I say I want to make a drawing, it'll bring up a drawing. Since I did it from that interface, it brought up this window right here, ready to go with that part. If that's not the part I wanted, I can click and browse, make a drawing out of any part I want. But that is in fact the part I want. Notice if I ask it to auto start the projected view, it does this trick where if I move it around, you'll see that when I'm in a, what they call orthographic view, which is straight up or straight across, it'll do a view where it's just rotated 90. If I go into the you know northwest, southwest, those kitty corners, those will give me isometric views. So once you've got a 3D model, making views off it's really easy. Um, the, the hardest part of SOLIDWORKS is definitely building the model. Making the drawing is an afterthought. If you notice how all these things have a capital A in front of them, what that means is there are dimensions that were in the model. I can choose to bring those across myself or I can put in my own. If I put in my own, it's a smart dimension. You know, especially if I have something that wasn't in the model. I'm sorry, the, the, cap, the stuff with the capital A is letting me know that there are dimensions from the model in that view. So I started on the, off on the front view and I put the dimensions on the L. Those are all the annotations that are on that front view. From the top, I can see the depths that I extruded it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. If I select these two items and say, bring in the model items, it's this little uh, dimension with a magic wand next to it. I can tell it to bring in for the entire model all the drawing views and eliminate duplicates. If you don't eliminate duplicates, it'll put all the dimensions on all the views. But you'll see that 
These are dimensions coming from the model. And there's a little bit of a difference when you're dealing with dimensions from the model, they're actually parametric. And this gets into that associative file type of thing. When I, uh, double click on any of these, I can change that dimension. And it changes in every drawing view. Let me do something a little more drastic so you guys can see it. So see when I rebuild it, all the drawing views just changed, which is great. If you've ever used a 2D drawing platform, that's cool. I don't have to change every view. You just change one, it changes them all. But also if I go in here, I click on a drawing view and tell it to open the part, it changed in the model. So when you're making changes, whether you're making them in a drawing, in a part, in an assembly, those changes happen in all of the other files. That's what the associative file is about. When you open up an assembly, it's not opening up a single file. It's opening up that assembly and it's loading all the part files into your RAM so that it can rebuild the geometry. Okay. The other type of file that we have besides a drawing is something called an assembly. An assembly is just components that fit together. So I can bring in that file I just built. Okay, again, Windows native. So if I were to hold my control key and do a drag and drop, that makes copies in Windows. It makes copies in SolidWorks too. You can do that with features, you can do that with parts. Um, like I said, it. Uh, SOLIDWORKS has an interface where if you do something somewhere, you can probably do it everywhere. <laughs> so it's, it's easy to guess your way through stuff. Okay, remember when I was putting relations onto my 2D sketch to give my thing a, a particular size? When you get into the assembly level, you have the same sort of operation, but these are called mates. Again, I hold my control key down so I can pick more than one thing. When I release my mate, instead of the relations that I had for sketches, horizontal and vertical and stuff like that, I have these relations that are called mates, how the parts conform to one another. Coincident is right face on face. So now when I move this part, I can move it all around, but if I'm looking at it from the side, I cannot move it up or down. It looks like it's moving up or down, but it's just moving backwards. Uh, if you want a true view, see how these things are when I'm rotating it? I'm doing that as I'm just holding down my middle mouse button. If you press the middle mouse button, or if it's a wheel mouse, hold down that wheel. When you move your mouse, it rotates about the center of your part or your assembly. Or down here, I can look straight down an axis. If it's going the wrong way, just click it again. It'll flip it 180. But okay, now that I'm looking at this, if I try and move this up and down, I get no. There's no way that's happening. Okay, so I'll continue relating this. I'll pick this face, hold my control key, pick this face, made them together. Again, you can get freedom of motion inside of SOLIDWORKS. Um, if the thing is not locked down, it will be able to move in whatever location. They call it degrees of freedom. At the beginning, it has six degrees of freedom. It can rotate about X, Y, or Z, or it can move laterally about X, Y, or Z. You start removing those freedom of motion by putting in the mates. Now all I've got is the ability to move back and forth in the X direction because of the mates I've got on here. I can go even a step further. If I put a mate between these two, now I can't move it at all, which is typically what you want if the thing's bolted down into the assembly. But if it's something like this uh, crankshaft that we're doing and stuff like that, you do want to have the ability to move stuff if it is a lever or some sort of mechanism, you can get a, a range of motion. You can even change them just like anything. Anytime you right click on something or select on something, you'll see feature with a pencil. That brings you in to whatever feature that was. Like there's some advanced mates. I, uh, I do often get this one where people will ask me about limit mates. So I changed that coincident where it was locked on this wall to a limit mate now has the ability to move back and forth 10 millimeters. So you can have like a drawer or a door that doesn't pull out in your design or you, it'll stop on wherever the stops are. 
All right, I'll save this again. Um, it's good to give it a unique name. with an initial or a date code or something at the end of it so that you don't get it confused with the rest of your block tests. And this is saving both of those and their relations? I'm sorry, what's the question? Is this saving now both of these together, the relations that you put together between those two different parts? Yeah, it saved the assembly. So in the assembly file, it's got the location of that file. So when it opens up, it loads two of those files and then it takes a look at how they're related. The, the mates definitely do get saved into it. His question was, did I just save everything? And absolutely, it saves all the work that I just did is in there. I um, mean, come back in, change what you've got or start adding more stuff. I did want to make a drawing out of this because you can make uh, an assembly drawing as well. They're very similar to a part drawing but you'll do things like uh, bills and materials and balloon callouts, things like that. So you see, there's that description that I put in there. It doesn't have a part number because I didn't assign it one, but you can have those different types of files. You can have a part, an assembly, and you can have drawings of parts for people that have to machine or inspect the parts and assembly drawings for people who have to put the thing together or you know someone at customs who wants to know what the heck's in your part you're trying to ship across a line. I'm gonna go into my window here and just do a uh, tile here so we can see all four of them at once. So here's really that associative thing uh, in real time here. Whether I change it here, it doesn't matter. It just changed in all four of them. There we go. Took a little time for that one to update. But basically, that's what happened. So you do want to remember that, that if you open up somebody's part and you drill a hole in it and you put it back, guess what? When they open up their assembly, why are there holes in my parts? Because that happens automatically. It's associated to that file. If you want to do a file that's like somebody else's, open it up, do a save as with a different name, and then you don't have that happen in their assembly. But making one of those changes should cause some sort of an error. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to see that in the restricted Okay, so the remember when I was playing around the feature manager tree and it flagged those things because I was playing around with when they happened in, in time? You get the same thing, whether it's a assembly or a drawing. I'm sorry. His question was uh, if if you make a change and an error happens, what does it tell you? It'll tell you at every level. When you open a drawing, if there's an error in the part, there'll be a little red dot next to the drawing view. You go down, you can find out exactly what feature is causing the error. Please take your errors out of your parts before you put them in. Um, we get that a lot of times where somebody will have an assembly and it's just got tons of them. Like, oh, it doesn't matter, it still rebuilds. So, well, sure about that? Um, so it's a good idea to, to troubleshoot whenever you do see a red thing pop up, but it definitely flags you. <laughs> Drops your first part into the assembly. How is it constrained by default? Good question. So his question was, when I drop my first part in, how is it constrained? It depends on how you drop it in. So that first one got fixed in space. It always fixes the first one in space, and I'll go over into that in a second. But if I just hit this green check mark, remember I talked about the zero, zero, zero? My part origin and my assembly origin are the same. They have the same front plane, same zero, 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 same back plane. That's how it drops it in by default. If you just hit the green check mark, it takes the part origin, sticks it onto the assembly origin for its location. However, if you select a component and you do not hit the green check mark, you hit it somewhere in the graphics area, then that is not constrained to anything. It's just floating out there in space. It's got those six degrees of freedom. You need to start adding mates to get it locked down into whatever position it's supposed to be in. In that case, would you mate it to like the assembly? Is that the preferred way or is it the order? Uh, depends. Yeah, it depends. So his question was, is it better to mate things to planes or to geometry inside of the assembly? And there's two different schools of thought. Um, obviously, the planes are going to give you something where uh, it doesn't matter if the parts go completely screwy. That one part's going to be exactly where you dimension it. Some people will, if you dimension a part with a particular uh, origin and you're just locking it, you can have it lock into the correct XYZ location. 
you know, it, as you're dropping it in. If you model it where it's supposed to be, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, you just drop it in without mating it. It'll, it'll go right in magically into place. I'll show you that in a second in our example. The other one would be mating to faces. Um, a lot of times people like to do that just to make sure about the stack up and stuff like that because uh, using planes is a theoretical, right? Where if you've got a model face, um, that's what the physically the thing is. So if you've, you've mated them all stacked together and they don't fit, sometimes you can mate them stacked together and the planes will work. But you, if you've gone over the space allowed for a particular part, maybe you bled into that where the plane's supposed to be. I don't know if I'm, am I getting close to answering your question? Yeah, so it's talking for your initial part, you might fix in place, right? Yeah, for the first part, I always, you always fix that. Um, the idea is because we've got a uh, range of motion, like for this bottle, I want to be able to spin the bottle cap in the assembly like it does in real life. But if the parts aren't fixed, the whole assembly just rolls around in space. So if you lock down the bottle, then I can spin this thing all around. It's fine. So you do want to have a part that's sort of the ground. And typically uh, when I'm building a part, there's going to be an enclosure, a case, a mount, something where it's like, okay, this is the part that it's holding still. The rest of the stuff is moving around that. So you want to start your assembly like that, putting whatever is the, the ground in first and then mating the rest of the stuff to it. If it's a part, you see how I've got this F and minus sign? That's between fix and float. When I drop it in using that, that uh, on the origin, it always comes in fixed in space and I can't move it around. This one's free to move, but if I want to, I can fix it. Okay, when you put in dimension or uh, relations, wow, I got this thing all gummed up because I took out the, the original part. But it's okay, because it's fast to do this. All I'm getting after here is if you've got it fully defined, where you've locked down all six degrees of freedom, let's take a look at our parts inside the feature manager tree. F, fixed in space, minus sign, still has freedom of motion. No symbol in front of it means it has no freedom of motion, but that is by mating it, not by just saying it's... You know, the, the fix is kind of, um, you know, overlordish. I command thee to be here, uh, where mates are in relation to either the geometry of the planes or the other faces on the parts so that you've locked down. That part now, would everything become underdefined? Yes. Okay. Because, like I said, now the whole thing can move, sort of like a bottle. Right. Okay, any questions before I, I kill these models here? All right. Don't worry, these are showing nothing. You just need to rebuild them. They, will, they do actually contain something. But when you've made changes, it'll give you that little box. And you're, hey, you've got to update this to see the new changes. All right. If you guys would like to follow along, this is the time for it. Uh, I just hit the R key. I know that sometimes I forget to say what I'm doing, but if you hit the R key, it shows you all the recent files that you've had open. So it's another nice one, kind of like that welcome screen where you're like, oh, that's what I was working on last night. This, same thing. I was just doing this before lunch. Boom, here's the last 10 parts I worked on. Okay, I do want to bring up something. This flashed for a second. Older version of the file. This is important. SolidWorks uh, does not um, regress. So if I have SolidWorks 2018, people with SolidWorks 2017, 2016 cannot open my files. People with 2019 can, but here's the thing. If they save it in 2019, now I can't. So. That's the thing, you all have to be on the same level. So if you are working in a group, not only do you have to find your templates, find out which version of SOLIDWORKS they are on. Most teams are using 18 and 19 these days. 20 is available, but we just don't use it. We usually wait until they've finished with the last service pack before we release it on the masses. 
Um, but that little question mark right there is letting me know that this was built before 2018. So if you ever see that flash, find out who sent it to you. What version do they have? Because if I hit save right now, if that guy was on 16, he's not opening this file anymore. I just turned it into a 2018 file. So you want to be aware of it. It does give you a little uh, flash to let you know, hey, this is an older version. What's that mean? It means you better know who sent it to you and what version they're on before you save it into yours because there's no way to get Once you've saved it, all you can send them is a step file or something. There's nothing that you can send them with all the features and all the, the ability to edit it anymore. Okay. So I showed you this a little earlier. Um, here's my feature manager tree. I can open stuff right from the feature manager tree. Just right click on it. This is what we're gonna be doing today. Just building this pin, this rod, fitting them together. You see the head's a little more complex. That one's already done for us. Um, but that's what the scope of this lesson's gonna be. So, if you are following along, go ahead and open up SolidWorks. If not, uh, you can certainly learn from just watching me. Either way you wanna do it. So I'm gonna start a new part. File new takes me to my templates. What do I wanna build? I wanna build a part. So double click on that, comes up. We've got our three planes and origins. That's all SolidWorks gives to us. So what's the first thing I need to do? Hmm? Sketch, I need to draw a sketch to start a part. So I pick the sketch plane that I want. I'm gonna draw this one on the right plane. I pick the sketch. I'm in the sketch right now. I'm going to do a circle. And then I will put a dimension on. So notice that it was 48 before. I just changed it to 13. It takes a second because it just scaled that thing down to instead of in the old days, it used to just shrink down. So it was really tiny on your screen. Then you had to zoom in. It, it, it's nice enough to, to have it be the same size with that new portion. That's all I need for this one. I'm gonna extrude this. Again, I can choose mid-plane, put in a value, say okay. All right, it's that horrible checkerboard for me. Why, why, how do I get rid of the checkerboard, at least on this? Material. Yep, I had a material. So make it out of steel. There we go. Okay, so when you're starting a brand new part, you have no choice but to use front, top, or right plane. Those are the only planes you have. Once you have a planar face, you can use that as a sketch plane. So if I wanna draw the thing on the end there, I can. Again, you do wanna pay attention to your first point because I wanna make sure I hit the center point on here. And then the first, point you select on a circle is your center point. The next one sets up the radius. Don't worry about so much getting the radius right because you're always going to put in a dimension. If you don't put in dimension, it'll still do a hole for you. It's just you have no idea what size that is. All right, and I'll do a feature. Cut. It's doing the same thing with that 60, but I don't trust it. I always want this to go through, so I'll just set it through all right away. Okay, on the command manager, you'll see we've got different tools. Anytime you see a little pull-down arrow like this, a little triangle that's pointing down, that means you have more than one choice. So for this, different ways to break an edge. I can do a fillet, which I showed you earlier, puts in a rounded edge, or I can do a chamfer, which you'll knock off an angled edge, whether I want it to be, um, you know, I can do it at angle and distance, distance and distance. There's different types of settings I can do using these little dots right here. Got a, little, got a little graph or a little picture on there showing you what dimensions you're using. So I'm just gonna do an angle and distance one. SolidWorks is really good at trying its best to put what you asked for in there, even if it doesn't make any sense. So if you put in a fillet that's too large, it'll put in as much of the fillet as it can. 
Here I've put in a chamfer that's way too big. Oh, it'll put it in there. The part just got way shorter. So you do want to be aware of, you know, it'll do what you asked. You just want to make sure that what you asked made sense where I don't want this part getting any shorter. I want it to just chamfer from the extents that I have right now. Okay. So I've got a material, I've got my parts here. I'm just gonna go ahead and save this out as pin with some sort of modifier. Okay, any questions on how I did that? Seem pretty straightforward? Okay, it's because it was, it was a really simple part. Let's try something a little more complex because I want to talk a little bit more about the sketcher tools, some of the stuff that you might be using, um, <clears throat> as well as some more design ideas. With this one, I'm going to start a sketch on my front plane. And I also want to show you a little bit about the interface and how to uh, access it. I don't use the pull downs. I did use the pull downs years ago because that's all I had. Then they came up with these icons. I started using the icons. Now they've got something that's called a mouse gesture. And I use them a lot and I try to get everybody else to use them because they do pick up your productivity a ton because I'm not spending a lot of time looking for buttons or things like that. I have my favorites when I hold my right mouse button down and I move my cursor a little, I've got these. You can have up to 12 on here. I think that gets a little busy. The, the, the sections are really too small. Uh, by default, it, it starts with four but that wasn't enough for me either. But what they do is if I move through that command, it starts that command for me. So if I go to the right, I start a line tool. So I'm not spending a lot of time going back and forth when really, here's my dimension tool, everything I need to do can be called up right on the screen. Okay, but when I was doing that mouse gesture, I didn't have a choice for center lines. Remember I told you the only difference between a line and a center line is a toggle? It's got a toggle right there for me on those pop-ups. So pay attention to the pop-ups. They often have things you probably will do. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, if you extrude a line, what it'll do, so I'm sorry, the question was, what happens when you extrude a line? When you extrude a line, it, it'll automatically do a thin contour. Let me, uh, hopefully you guys can see that on the screen here. So remember when I did this, I could have actually just drawn this. When you extrude something that's what's called an open contour, this one's closed. When you extrude an open contour, it not only asks you for the depth that you want to extrude this thing, but it also will ask for a wall thickness, which probably would have been a better way to design this part, but didn't go into my narrative as easily. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you a little later because there's closed, there's open, that's fine. But you can also have, if you do a sketch like that, where it's open or closed, then it's gonna start asking you questions as to what you wanted to do with that shape. All right, I did wanna show you a couple more tools. So I'll go into my line tool. Notice I'm gonna draw a vertical line. So I'm waiting for that yellow dot to, to come and that one's vertical. This one, I'm just gonna draw a skew at an angle. When you have one that's got a relation, take a look at how it moves around. It doesn't matter which endpoint I move, it stays you know, vertical like I asked it to. You can drag and drop and attach relations as well to a part. Do you have a question back there, sir? Can you pop the screen back on over here? Oh, sorry. Better? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, but take a look when I have this one that has no relation on it, it's a whole lot more floppy as far as how it moves. 
uh, because it doesn't have any kind of orientation to it. So I have to drag it by the endpoints. If you drag it by the line itself, it'll stay in that orientation. Um, but it, you know, it's a lot harder to control one that is underdefined. Remember I told you control key? You can put relations like that. The reason I'm doing the relations for this one like this, rather than just snapping it to it, the problem is, is that when you snap to it, see how the quadrants light up? Snap to a quadrant, which would be fine if the top and bottom were the same diameter, because the bottom is fatter, this one's gonna be a little above the nine o'clock and this one's gonna be a little past the, the nine o'clock. So I don't wanna accidentally snap them to it, so I just drew more line than I needed. And also because that's gonna feed into the next part I wanna talk about. What I wanna talk about is mirrors and trims, because you use them a lot, especially you should use mirrors, uh, three-dimensional, two-dimensional, whatever, cut your time in half. If the part is symmetrical, just draw half of it and mirror it, and then you're done. So when you've got a shape that you would like to have mirrored, SolidWorks has a 2D mirror entities tool right here on my sketch toolbar. When I'm doing that, I have to pick what I want mirrored and what I want to mirror about. This can be a construction line or a solid line. It doesn't matter. It does have to be a line though. And you'll see when I've got that, it puts these little symmetric relations on there, letting me know that they're always going to be the equal on both sides of that mirror. Okay, that's the slow way. If one of your pieces of geometry happens to be a center line like this, it cuts down the picking considerably. Because if I pick geometry and a center line and hit mirror, it just assumes that center line was what I wanted to mirror about. If there's two center lines, it won't do it. It'll ask you which one do you want to mirror about. But if it's just got one, it figures it out. Always the same distance from it, always the same size. Okay. Those are both nice. There's one that I like to use a lot, and I also like to just show it in here. If you have a command that you've used before and you can't remember what the name of it is or where the button is, have kind of a, it's something about mirror. If I go up in here and type in mirror, it'll show me all the features that have that word in it. It'll do partial for you. Just MIR is good enough to bring both these up. Also, the gray ones let me know you can't do those right now. Those are three-dimensional mirrors where I'm mirroring features. I can do the two-dimensional ones. But notice, I showed you the mirror entities. There's also this one called dynamic. That's the one I want. I don't want to have to find that again. You just click, drag, now it's on your toolbar. If you didn't want it on your toolbar, click and drag it off of there. Actually, when you modify um, the keyboard, you just click and drag it off of there. You don't want it on there. So you can modify this stuff. It's pretty easy to find things. Um, also, if you just want it for one time, you can look it up, click it. It just took you into that tool. All right, what dynamic mirror does for me is if I select a line, see how it puts the little hash marks on the top and bottom of the line for me? That's letting me know that that is an active mirror which means anything I draw on one side is magically drawn on the other side. It doesn't matter which side I draw it on. So that is typically what I'll do. If I know it's gonna be a symmetrical part, I'll draw a center line, say dynamic mirror, just draw half of it, and the other half is drawing itself as I'm going. Okay, so that one's fantastic. Mirror tool, save you a lot of time. Also, you don't always have the cleanest of sketch. You can trim stuff up. They give you a bunch of trim options. Uh, these two are really just a throwback. This is how people had used to have to work in AutoCAD, where you had to pick what you were going to trim with, and then you would either trim away the items 
or fill in the items. What SOLIDWORKS came up with was with this one called trim to closest. And what that does is that just snips it back to the next intersection. But what's even nicer is with the AutoCAD way, I always had something to trim with. I couldn't just trim away to nothing. This one, I can just keep trimming until I don't have a sketch. Okay. So that was cool back in the 90s when they came up with it, but it only took them a few years to improve it with this thing called power trim, which is the same idea, but what it is is you click and drag and it does that trim to next wherever you go through. Notice how it has that little red dot. That's if you go through too far, you hit the red dots again, it'll put the stuff back. So that's the only trim tool you ever need because you can just play a little video game right here and snip through everything without having to pick and choose what you're going to trim with. Oh, yeah. But why I brought it up here is because I actually wanted to trim these off. Okay, hit my escape key to get out of here. Um, I just realized I made these things a little too small. So again, if you double click in the modify, type in the value you want or an equation or whatever you're after and it'll do that. Okay, so I trimmed this away and I know that they're not at the nine o'clock so they didn't accidentally get locked down there because I made them tangent to the circle and then just trimmed off the excess. The other thing I want to do is mirror it. Because I had a center line in there, I did that green box select, picked the center line off two lines, and mirrored them on the other side. So now I've got this shape coming along nicely. Still have a couple more things I want to do. I'm going to do an offset. So what an offset does for you is you can put in a value. If you pick a line or an edge, it'll offset that for you. Which direction you want to go is up to you. I can do both of these at once. It gets into something called uh, design intent. Sort of like, remember when that hole wasn't going all the way through? And I was like, I want that hole to always go through. That's my design intent. With this one, if I do them both at the same time, the offsets are only going to have one dimension. So see, I've got this five here. When I change that, it changes both of them. If I wanted to be independent, I would have put them in as two separate entities. I would have done one, gotten out of the tool, gone back in, done the other. In fact, let me show you how to do that. Okay, the control Z is undo. Also use this thing right here. You do have to be aware. You can only undo until your last rebuild. Remember the stoplight that I was hitting? Once you hit the stoplight, it clears out whatever that was. Once you hit save, it clears out whatever that was. The thing is, is that the part can't have like a list of every command you've ever done in it, or the part file would be gigantic because it's just remembering all the clicks you did. So if I click on this pull down, next thing I'm do, that's how far I can go back. If I hit rebuild right now, that'll clear out but I can pick and choose, you know, if I want to go back to when I was trimming parts, I can undo. Okay, if I did want those to be independent, go like this, either hit your green check mark or enter key always does the same thing, that's an accept, but the enter key is um, more magical than that. Not only is it accept, if you hit it again, it gets you into whatever tool you were doing last. So if you're putting in a lot of these things, you hit enter, boom, enter, boom, enter. You keep getting in and out of the same tool. Um, but there we go. Now you can see that these two have independent dimensions. So if I want one to be thicker than the other, I can do that. Where with that other one, I couldn't because they were locked together by the way that I built it. Okay, is this fully defined or not? Not. I get a lot of people saying not, and you're right, it's not. If you want a really good eye chart, look in the lower right-hand corner 
of this, and it'll say underdefined. Um, I don't bother with that. It's just blue and black lets me know. Also, the way that I usually figure out what dimension I need is if I only have a couple of blue entities, just click and drag them and see what freedom they have. So these things don't have a height or a width. Either one of those will, will get me to where I need to go. So it's kind of up to me as to which one I think is important. I'm going with the width. And now this has changed to fully defined down here. Again, the eye chart. <laughs> All right. Back to open closed contours. Even though it isn't as simple as a square with a line through it, the same thing is happening here. I've got closed contours and I've got lines intersecting and it doesn't know what it's supposed to extrude. So when you've got a sketch like that and you go to extrude, two things happen. One, you don't get that preview. Remember I told you the warm fuzzy feeling I get when I see a preview? All of a sudden warm fuzzy feeling's gone. Now I have to think about it. Why isn't this thing doing what I want? Okay, it's asking for me to put information in. Do you know where it is asking that? No, you would think. So what you want to do when you're in, it, in the property manager for the first time is scan it and see if any of the boxes are blue. When it's a blue box, it's waiting on you to fill that box in. So... It's saying selected contours. There's different ways I can do this. I can pick that exterior circle. It'll do that, extrude that circle. I can pick the interior circle and it'll do that one. Or you can pick regions like that ring. I've told you about the right click always has options for you. When you're in the middle of a feature, if you right click, all the end conditions are right there. So I can set it to mid plane again on screen. Another thing I like to use are these uh, pulls. Whenever you pull these handles, a little scale appears. You can snap it to that scale. If you zoom in closer, the scale gets to be finer. You zoom out, it gets to be coarse. But if you hold your cursor over it, it'll actually snap to the numbers on the scale. But again, also you can always just fill in a hard number right here. Hit enter, goes in again. Okay. Wow, that is not as much part as I wish it was. So don't panic. My sketch is not gone. Remember, when you're looking at the feature manager tree, there's different types of features. There's sketch-based features and the applied features. This is a sketch-based feature. It always nests the sketch underneath the feature and hides it so that otherwise you just see sketches all over the place. So once you've used the sketch, it figures you're not going to use it again. It hides it, and it places it under the feature in the feature manager tree. However, you can use it again if you would like. If I select on this sketch, and notice the sketch looks a little different. Um, the typical sketch looks like that, sort of a line with an art going. I've got something that looks like that for what my sketch is. That symbol means I've only used a contour. I've only used a piece of the sketch. Just a little heads up to be like, hey, you drew a whole lot of stuff, you only used a portion of it. Which is good, because I want to use more of that. I pick the sketch in the feature manager tree and hit extrude. It'll show me that sketch again. I can pick the regions that I want. Keep going. There we go. So they're all using the same sketch, which is great because all of my design is all in one sketch. I double click and I have access to every dimension. Um, often when you do like, okay, this feature, that feature, this feature, that feature, they have a ton of sketches that are driving it. You have to figure out which one is doing what. Um, a lot of people like to design in this way, kind of, I'm going to design an overview. Another reason people do this is if you've got a drawing from like AutoCAD or something that's ancient, you can actually copy it to your clipboard from AutoCAD and paste it into a SolidWorks sketch and just start extruding it. 
Um, it is a garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. So you do have to be careful with what DXF you've decided to use. Um, but that's another reason. If you've already got a view where, hey, I'm looking at this whole thing from one side, you can use that multiple contour to say, okay, I want to extrude the outside. Now I'll cut in these holes or whatever you're doing. And when I double click on these things, not only do, do all the sketches pop up, but here's the dimensions you know, for the extrusion depths as well. So I can change that. There's that checkerboard. You gotta change that. There we go. Now I've got a solid part. Save it with a name. Any questions on how I built that? How are you guys doing as far as, is this what you were hoping to see? Um, do you have any questions? Should I keep going? Keep going? All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up an existing file. Here is a drawing. There's over here, remember I showed you uh, this tab a while ago where I can put in more views if I want to. There's another tab in here that's kind of nice, the File Explorer. It's, it's nice for a couple of reasons. I can grab parts right from here, like I'm in File Explorer without having File Explorer open, just drag and drop them into an assembly uh, or drag them into this drawing, whatever I want to do. And it also has this one open in SolidWorks. I want you to take a look at this. Okay, you see, I've got four things open in SolidWorks right now. Two of them are not a surprise, the pin and the rod I just made. I never close those up. You can have multiple windows open in the same session of SolidWorks, not a problem. Well, sort of not a problem. Once you get over two dozen, it can be a problem. Just graphically, your computer trying to do it for you. Um, but a lot of times I'll have different windows open. Uh, but I want you to notice the, that there's different ways that they've colored it. One of them is really dark. That is the one that I'm looking at now. If I go over and switch over to the rod, the rod will be the dark one to show me which window is active. This other one that looks hollow is because it's only in RAM. It is not open in its own window. So how to get open? When you open up an assembly, when you open up a drawing, remember I talked about those associative files? They get loaded into RAM. So when I loaded up the drawing, it said, okay, here's the drawing file. What's this a drawing of? This part brings the part into RAM, and then it's able to recalculate all the different drawing views, put in all the dimensions for me. That's how the magic works. Okay, so that is one thing you want to know. It's like, how come my computer's running so slow? All I have is this assembly open? Well, you have the assembly plus every part that's in that assembly in RAM, typically, by default. Now, when I talk about how this is solving, the, the 3D model is inside of here, even though I've only got 2D representations of it right now. If I were to click on a view inside of the drawing, they've got this 3D drawing view where I can actually take a look in the 2D view of what is this 3D model look like? Because it's in RAM, it's pretty easy for it to show me the whole model, not just the views that I've asked for. Also, whether you're in an assembly or whether you're in a drawing, if you select on a part in that assembly or select on a part in that drawing, it'll always give you this open choice for it brings up the file. And now you'll see that uh, this should turn to solid. Oh, well. Um, also, uh, if I do tile these things, Notice the one that's got the dark, darker blue, that's the one that I'm active in now. So you have to click it, highlight that view, and then you can actually access that file inside of that window. What I wanted to talk about here was the feature manager tree. 
So I showed you some tricks with it earlier where I can actually rearrange stuff inside the feature manager tree, which is nice from a design standpoint. If you forgot to do something at a certain time, you can use this rollback bar. What happens is any new feature that you add gets added wherever that rollback bar is. But if you roll it back to a certain point in time, maybe extrude this with some draft, it puts that feature in the feature manager tree wherever that blue bar is. So again, if you forgot to do something, you don't have to start all over again. You just roll back to where you were in that design, put it in there. Um, it may lead to problems later on. I don't know, yeah, the shell, the shell was fine with it. I'm not really fine with that, but um, you know, when you roll it forward, the stuff will attempt to rebuild. If you've taken away features or something like that, you might have a problem. Um, there's a couple other things inside of the feature manager tree. Um, like when we're looking at this pin part, feature manager, property manager, configuration manager. Okay. What configurations allow you to do? Remember I said, hey, you know, if you open up somebody's part and you drill a hole in it and then you put it back, they're going to have a hole in their part. There's a way you can do that without even creating a new file. If you create a new configuration, His assembly is still using the default one. I can put holes in this and it won't, it'll only be in this version. So you can have multiple versions inside of the same file. It gets tricky, but it's a nice uh, design tool. Um, whether you're making a simplified one or whether you wanna have a couple different versions, uh, if I take these items and I delete them, they're gone from all versions. A delete is a permanent across, but this suppress is an on off switch. Come on, it's on there, it's off there. Um, I can actually split this tree so you can see a little what's happening. See how those get highlighted? Or grayed out. This gets into a thing called parent-child relation. So you notice when I turned off the cut, the chamfer got turned off too. Inside of 2019, 2018, like that, there's a thing that you can show what external references are on. So you notice that when I click on here, this is a parent, this is a child. Parents are all blue, children are all purple. If you turn off the parent, the child gets turned off. Turn on the child, parents get turned on because they need to be there for it to solve. So just to let you know, why did that turn off everything? It's that whole parent-child relationship. As you start, if you do get into errors and troubleshooting and stuff, you're going to learn a lot about those <laughs> because as you're building features, you know, there's, there's a order of operations that you're doing. Um, and so if you can't have a chamfer because the cut's not there, or if you delete something, sometimes other features, in fact, when you go to delete it, it is nice enough to tell you, Hey, you're also deleting these and it'll show you a list. So if you see a long list, probably don't do it. Okay, so that's the difference between delete and suppress. Delete is a permanent on every version of the part. Suppress allows you to turn it on and off. But what I also wanted to show you here was that you can use this as an investigative tool. I get this part, somebody else built it. I have no idea how they did it. If I just click and drag this, I can see feature by feature how they made it. If I'm not sure even how to do a shell, remember, just go in here, hit the question mark, there's everything I need to know about shells. I'm sorry, you had a question, sir? Yeah, I was just thinking about this configuration management thing, and wondering how far can you take it. So if you do things like save the base part and then have different configurations that scale it differently, is it open season, you can add any of these uh, Features. Okay, so his question was uh, configurations. Uh, 
how out of hand can you get? They're only inside of a single file. So, so it's not going to be a thing where you've got a file with this version, file with that version. You just open up the one file. It's got all the screws or all the nuts, and you just have different versions of them. When you're talking about what you control in a configuration, here I've got a multiple configuration part. When you do that, when you double click on a dimension, you have a new option. By default, that dimension will change in every version, but it doesn't have to. I can just make a shorter version, longer version. That's another reason people do configurations. Um, it gets really deep because you can use Excel and lookup charts to do these things. So you can get pretty crazy with instantly making hundreds of versions of the part. Um, we try to keep it to low roar. In fact, uh, with our custom parts here at X, we don't do configurations because we want each file that's in our PLM system to have just one file that's referencing. Um, other teams do do configurations, but then they have it's on them to manage that stuff on how it's how it's going. Because yes, you can quickly make a hundred different versions of it. Do you want all one hundred pieces in just one file? Um, you know, you start to run into uh, safety issues and things like that. If if that file gets messed up, all of a sudden you have no hardware in any of your parts. Um, also, it can get it can get tedious to try and uh, edit parts that have over 10 configurations. So yes, it's limitless almost into the amount of stuff you can do, but you should limit yourself. Um, you know, don't go hog wild. Don't, don't build your entire thing just with one model. Because you can do that. You can actually suppress a whole body and extrude a different body and now it's not even the same part. Why are you doing it in the same file? Um, so yeah. I, I, I'm sure all software does this. There's a lot of things that you can do, but should you do them is the question. Okay. I am getting near the end here, because like I said, it's only gonna go till three, but if you'd like to stick around and ask me questions, you can. But what I'm gonna do now, I've got the three components. I wanna start putting together this assembly. So, I'm going to start with this part. You, again, you want the part that's going to stand still. Uh, my rod's supposed to have a pendulum action, so I'm not going to put that in first. I'd rather have the head stand still and be able to control where the rod is. So I'm going to say, let's make an assembly out of this. It's going to ask me for the template I want to use. I'll use this millimeter one. And for this, as I told you, um, I say, let's have a graphics preview. It'll show me where the part is going to be, but typically what I'll do for my first part is just drop it on the origin. Now I've got the same origin for my model that is for my assembly, and that can come in useful. Remember I had mentioned earlier, if you model the stuff in the orientation it's supposed to be, you don't even need to mate it. So hopefully I started my pin on the correct Plane, I'll find out in a second here. Perfect. Bing, right in the hole, didn't even need to mate it. Why? Because I used the right plane that is the same right plane here. And the origin for the head goes right through the hole. So again, you can model the stuff in the correct X, Y, Z point and then just drag it into your assembly and bang, 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 fix it in space if it's not going to move, that's fine. That's just less mating that I have to do. Um, and it's actually a lot uh, faster for SOLIDWORKS. Remember I said when it loads the assembly, first it gets all the parts, then it figures out how to fit them together. If there's no mates, if they're just fixed in space, there's no time for it to calculate. It's just there, it's there, it's there, it's there. It's done. It's not saying, well, where's the part that it's mated to? Okay, this last part though, notice if I just drop it in, that is not in the right location. Doesn't matter, I don't want that thing there anyways. I'm gonna drop it somewhere here. Now, I want this to mate, so you can use face-to-face. -face. Earlier, somebody had asked me, do, uh, you know, do you mate the planes? Definitely you can, and there are times when it is a great time to do that. Like the front plane on this part would be cool if it was on the right plane of the assembly, and now it is. 
So uh, usually I'll try and do face to face with this sort of stuff to, to make sure that the, the holes are all true and your, the screws are going in the direction that you want, that kind of stuff. But when it comes time to centering stuff, a lot of times I'll use the theoretical planes that are in the part. Okay, now SolidWorks has freedom of motion. That will not happen in the real world, right? So there's different ways of calculating what the problems are. In my evaluate toolbar, this is the same place that I got that mass properties. Mass properties works at the assembly level too. It'll figure out what's the weight of this part. You know, this part's rubber, this part's plastic, this part's metal, it figures out all the weights of all the parts and then puts them together here in this assembly to give me the full assembly. So notice how that points kind of over there. If I move this, and recalculate, the center just moved because it has to do with where the pendulum is. All right. So other ways to test is there's one called interference detection. You calculate, plays a little tune for you, and it shows you overlap of where the volumes are running into each other. So, that's obviously not going to work there. How about we make this a little bigger? So it's just saying that the outside diameter of the pin is not the same size as the inside diameter of that. The inside diameter was too small. I had a, a it would have been a press fit, a really hard press fit at that. So would not have made it good for me. But now I hit interference detection. You have to hit calculate. No interference. Um, this is a snapshot in time because it has to do with where your part is. If I move it to there and run the same test, now there is interference. So it's a static test that you're doing with the interference. As these things lay right now, do they run into each other? It moves up around now, do they run into each other? But there's another way that you can do it uh, that's really helpful for design when you're trying to figure out range of motion and things like that. When I'm at the assembly level, you've seen me do this type of operation before. I'm able to move parts around that are not fully defined. This is one of those things that takes me back to the bad old days. Notice when I'm doing this, watch this button. See how it gets pressed in? When I stop doing it, it turns off. I used to always have to press move component 20 years ago before I could move the component. But then people were like, I'm always moving components. Why do I have to keep getting in this tool? And just click and drag it. So you can, but when you click and drag, you're only doing this thing called free drag, which is basically the software is thinking that this part is like a ghost and it doesn't care whether they run into each other. And usually during, during your design, that's what you're after. It would be horrible if I had to take a screw and then bang it, you know, bang it around through the assembly model to get it into place so when I can just float it right through everything and drop it right where I want it. Okay, so. Free drag is what it does when you just click this and it turns on or off. But there's other choices. Besides the standard drag, I can do collision detection. What that does, and I've got a... Okay. So you can, it usually does a ding. You, you can make it say anything you want. But you can say, hey, when you run into collision, Give me an audio. It also shows you a visual. Okay. Uh, where it highlights, it stops at it, and it highlights the faces that just touch to each other. Um, so I can move it to that point, take a measurement, and say, oh, that's, you know, I showed you guys the measurement tool earlier. Um, under evaluate, I can measure this to that and find out that's the, you know, maximum angle I can get out of this thing before it hits the wall. So again, some of the stuff, you know, with 3D modeling, uh, it takes a lot of guesswork. It gives you a lot of information on your model before you have to start cutting metal. You know the thing will theoretically work <laughs> in there. Um, you know, you can check the interference. You can check range of motion. Okay. How am I doing? You guys have any questions on this assembly? Is there a way to fully define it with 
is, or is it, I mean, the intention obviously is to think it's sold back and forth, but is there like a loop that you can include to where it's fully defined, or does that really even matter? It doesn't matter. I want to leave it with freedom of motion because remember I showed you I had the little boxer engine? If those things are locked, in fact, um, if I don't leave freedom of motion in this, the boxer isn't going to work because as the, as the pistons are going up and down, the piston rod is doing this type of thing. No, if, if, if you want to have motion in it, it has to be underdefined. Um, I'll ask the opposite question. Is there a way to say that this, uh, this pin goes through this hole, but it is not rotating? Yes. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if this thing's moving, that thing has to move. And that gets to another point. See these subassemblies? Go back into this top level. Typically, a subassembly, like these carburetors, look like this, where it's a part file with a blue block sitting on its shoulder. This one has a blue block floating. That means it's able to move. It's a flexible assembly. SolidWorks is always trying to take it easy on your computer. So if an assembly isn't supposed to move, it assumes none of them are supposed to move whenever you bring in a subassembly. You have to, when I click on it, I have this toggle right here, whether I want that subassembly to be able to move or not. If there's nothing inside the subassembly that moves, it's not going to do anything. But if I were to go into this one and turn that off, doesn't move anymore. Selected components fully defined. Hey, this thing used to go, used to do the boxer trick. Doesn't do the boxer trick because that one assembly is just stuck. And how is it stuck? It's stuck in the same orientation that I just saved it in. So it just opens it up. This is how the guy saved it in this orientation. That's how it is permanently until you make it flexible. Once it's flexible, the magic happens again. No, no, it's only keeping track of it in this assembly. All right, last thing I want to cover is hardware. And uh, just pretty much all kinds of uh, things that you may want to do. Never design your own hardware. Why? Because there's a company that designed all of them for you. I have not created a nut or bolt or anything in years. And they've got a really nice interface. I need a retaining ring. Uh, it's shaped like this. Uh, metric. Oops, sorry. Metric. Dial up the size. Hey, here's the three different parts. I just have to pick which material I want. Okay. I'll pick that one. When I go to the product detail, this page is what we use to classify our hardware. You just print, do a print to this and send it to PLM people. Here's the hardware that I'm using. And then I set this to, notice that it's got all sorts of 3D models, but one of them says SolidWorks. It is a native SolidWorks file. It has features and sketches and all that kind of stuff, so you can manipulate it if you want. Usually you don't want to with purchase parts, but um, it's nicer than just getting a dumb block because I can do things like, um, so all I do is say save, click on here. There we go. I just finished modeling my retaining ring. Done. So that is how you should do mo models. The only problem that they really have is they have a, a habit of uh, leaving sketches on and things like that. So you, sometimes you want to turn those off. Another horrible thing that they do Again, is, is the whole too much detail thing? Let me just quickly find one. Because I know they all stink. If you already get a piece of hardware like this, please, please, for the love of God, suppress that coil. 
The thing is, is that for SOLIDWORKS to draw a picture for you, it's got to think of where all the edges are. And then if they're not seen, it has to erase those edges and things like that. So it's drawing a lot of things. If you have a helix on one of those parts, it takes longer. If you have 400 of those parts, you have just locked down your computer when you try to revolve the assembly because it's taking time going, okay, I got to draw these circles. And then you rotate it again. Oh, I got to draw it again. So turn those off. It'll save you in the long run. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. Just suppress that. That's how I always save the hardware. Um, other places where you can get stuff off of the web, um, there is a big one that people use a lot called GrabCAD, which has a ton of stuff. And a lot of this will be in SolidWorks. Uh, again, it, it, it depends. Sometimes people will just put renderings on there if they want you to somehow buy their model or something like that. But a lot of people just post stuff off for free. Trouble is, this is a social media platform. Who knows what's, who's putting stuff on here? Does this thing really work? Does it even fit together? Did he fudge anything on his models? Who knows? It's just some dude named Lingaston. So I don't know, is that guy a good modeler? If you want more trustworthy stuff, obviously McMaster is a place to go when you're looking for hardware. Um, for everything else, Three D Content Central is curated by SolidWorks, and the models come from suppliers. So, I know that the AD Twenty parts were designed somebody at AD Twenty. I don't have to worry about you know whether his surfaces are any good or whatever. At least I'm hoping. But typically, what what I find here from the supplier end of the stuff, it's it's nice, and you can go out there, grab the parts you're using. It's all free because the suppliers know if you start dropping their models into your assembly, at some point, you're going to call them and order those parts for your assembly. So the models are free. Um, so there's a few different places. McMaster for your hardware. Vendor stuff can come from 3D Content Central. Uh, GrabCAD, I'll, I'll typically just use for like, I don't know, cool models people build. There's, there's all kinds of stuff, motorcycles and planes, but um, I rarely put stuff in there. That's not true. They had a Raspberry Pi. They have like some of that stuff that you can go, oh, somebody took I modeled this. Just grab theirs if you can't get one from uh, the people who make it. All right, let's get back to this retaining ring. A few things I want to do. One thing is I want to cut a groove for the ring. You can reuse sketches. Remember I showed you that earlier. So I'm taking the circle that I drew this thing with. I talked a little bit about the fact that if you have a thin walled feature, it automatically gives you a wall thickness. You can actually turn anything into a thin feature. Say so I want this to go one millimeter deep but I want you to go, sorry, the wall thickness, one millimeter into the part. It's one millimeter wide, but it's in the middle of my part. I don't like that. So far, everything that I've extruded has always been from the sketch plane, which it is by default. I talked about end conditions. There's also a from condition. By default, it's just set to the sketch plane but I don't have to create a new sketch plane. Hey now. That's all I gotta do. Say, starts 27 away from it, goes towards the outsides, one millimeter thick, has a cut. Using that same circle. Because I use the same sketch, if I change the size of this, I know that ring, that groove is gonna be the same size because it's using the same diameter. The original sketch feature, yep, that, that did the whole cylinder. So I didn't need to create a new sketch. I didn't need to create a new plane. I can just reuse the geometry that I've got in there pretty easily. Also, I showed you guys how to do a 2D mirror. 3D mirror is pretty much the same thing. Just pick the plane you want, pick the feature you want to mirror. 
And there you go. If I make changes to this one, this one's always going to be symmetrical with it. All right, so remember, because this is an associative file, when I go back to this, there's that groove. I want to put the retaining ring in that groove. There's a couple ways of doing that. You can just click and drag from one window into another. And I showed you guys how to mate. See, this is the kind of stuff that the McMaster guys leave in their models. Um, I showed you that I can pick this face, I can pick this edge, I can do a mate between them. Uh, there's also a smart mate tool. And if I hold my Alt key down and I pick a, uh, a cylinder, a cylindrical face like this, when I've got the Alt key down, when I move it to any other circle, circular face, see it tries to, to be concentric with whatever circle I pick. Same thing if I hold the Alt key and I pick a flat face, it wants to put that flat face on whatever flat face I did, coincident. So it's got two for this, the, um, for the tool, but there's a, another one that you get a two for four. Let me, okay. Come on. All right, when I'm in an assembly, if I left click on a model, it'll drag translate. If I right click and drag, it'll rotate that model. And then the middle mouse button is still the entire screen. So I can get this thing sort of into the position that I want. If you pick a circular edge and you hold your Alt key, it does two at once. It does a concentric and a coincident. Circular edges are concentric. The two flat faces where those edges were are now coincident. To get to your question, I don't want this. I do want this to pendulum, but I don't want this thing sliding around. Anytime you have a concentric mate, if you right click on it, there's a choice to lock the rotation. And then that no longer can spin. So it's, that's typically what I'll do for hardware uh, to get it fully defined, rather than putting in a bunch of mates, you can just put in two and then lock it. Okay, so when you're in the same screen, you need to hold that hot key to get your smart mates. If you're going from one screen to another, I know this blows a lot of people's minds, especially if they use SolidWorks and never knew it did this. I don't need to hold a hot key. I can just drag circular edge onto circular edge from one window into another, and I get that same twofer. So, okay, that is how to put together an assembly, a little bit about where to get some files, like hardware and uh, things from vendors, so you don't have to model them yourself. Um, that was really what I wanted to, to cover today. Did you guys have any questions on anything that I showed here? Uh, so I have a question online here. Yes. So if, I, if I'm in an assembly and I want to uh, build a part, uh, so like how do I decide which plane to pick? Like can I pick a plane from other part in the assembly? Or, or I have to just like make a new part and insert it. Okay, that uh, it sounds like a simple question, but it's actually kind of complex because uh, you can do either way. They have different ways of designing SolidWorks models. What I just showed you here was something called bottom-up assembly, where you build all the parts individually and then you throw them together in an assembly. You can also do a top-down design. Um, it gets much more complex. So when I go to insert a part, so far I've just been doing this insert component. It brings me to a browser, I pick what file I wanna put in, I'm done. But if I say I wanna do a new part, first I pick my thing, what it's asking me here is what plane do I wanna start on? So I can actually start it on the plane of that part. And I can start building a part you know, based on that. You can even, you know, put dimensions to items um, inside of your assembly. Um, so if I wanted it to be a certain distance away from the edge of this, I could do that. So, but the, the danger that you um, have when you're building a part like this, 
you know, if I, if I wanted to build a, like a cylinder wall for this thing inside this assembly, I certainly can do that. So that's the type of thing you were talking about? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, the, the, the trouble is, and, and there's, there's different uh, ways to do this. By doing it the way that I did, see these little symbols here? They look like a less than and a greater than symbol. Those are called external references. And what that means is this part doesn't really know what shape it is without the assembly. If I were to open the part on its own, it would just open up as last saved. But if somebody went in and changed the assembly, that thing could change. If it's always five smaller than or five larger than the, the cylinder head, somebody goes in and changes the cylinder head until that assembly is updated, that change doesn't happen. So you get a part that only exists inside of this assembly. There's different ways to deal with that. By default, if you look at my feature manager tree, see how this has these hard parentheses around it? That's called a virtual part. There is no SLD PRT. There is no external file for anybody to open up. They can't browse for it in Windows and open the file. The only way they can find the file is if they open this assembly. And that's great for if you're building like uh, cable routes or something like that that only go in this assembly. The only time you'd be looking at it is when you've got this assembly open. Um, but it makes it so it's sort of a phantom part. And so it makes it tough to send to people and things like that. So if you want it to be its own part, you have to save it as an external file. There is a setting if you want to do that automatically so you can skip this step. But usually I want to give it a rename like because whatever I name this thing in the feature manager tree is gonna be the name of the part when I save it. So it's still got those parentheses around it. Yep, hold on. Here we go. If I save it, now I've got an external file that people can look up, they can work on. They don't need to open the assembly to actually see this file. The thing is, is that when you see a part that's got these symbols, it's another one of those warm and fuzzy feeling things that I get. If I see that symbol, this part might change size at any time. Okay. Uh, because if I open it up right now, let's, let's take a look. The assembly that I designed it in, let's save and close. See those question marks? If I don't have the assembly open, it doesn't know if that's the actual size of the part. It's not going to resolve until I open the assembly up. And then it'll take a look at the geometry in the assembly. If it's the same geometry, no change happens. But if somebody made that cylinder bigger or changed its location, the part will move like I asked it to. Um, so yes, you absolutely can build in the assembly, but you kind of want to know what you're doing when you're doing it, whether you're doing a virtual part or you want to have an external part. Also, this is great for the R&D phase when you're like, well, I think it goes here and it's like the size of that. But when it comes time to release it and have somebody build it, you want to have real numbers in there and you don't want to have it change size. So if I go in to edit this sketch and I go to list the relations, I can see whatever external relations are in there and just get rid of them. So when I do that, see how the little symbol disappeared? Mm -hmm. So now this part's on its own. I built it inside, so I know it's the right size. But since I went in there and put in real numbers instead of you know relations to a, another part, I've all of a sudden made it so that now I don't have to worry about this part changing size. And you always want to do this before you go release it to, for somebody to, to build or something like that. It's just really bad practice to have external references on there. Um, there's other tricks you can you can do quickly, like you can lock all external references so it doesn't change, or you can blow away all external references. Uh, but that one's a little dangerous because if you did want it to to somehow go.
go back. You have to go back into the assembly and redo all that work that you did before to attach it again. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, very well. Thanks a lot. Perfect. And and we do a lot of that stuff. Like if you're doing a coating or a covering for something, it's great to build it in the assembly because you know it's the right size. But then, like I said, we'll go into the part, we'll strip out the external references, we'll save it as its own file um, once we've got that, that R&D section done. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Um, I don't have any questions specifically about this, but as far as like other tutorials and walkthroughs. Oh, hey. Like that's a, that's a great question. I forgot to mention that. Okay, he asked me, uh, this is a good class, but what when you're not here, how do you learn about SOLIDWORKS? Okay, in the help pull down, SOLIDWORKS has some tutorials. If you are a brand newbie, this getting started tutorial is great. It walks you through. Um, if you don't know where something is, you click it, it brings up the thing and says, here, click here, click here. So it walks you through it. Um, so these are a great thing for you know, the picks and clicks of building parts, and it's got a ton of them. Uh, they get into uh, even like uh, analysis or sheet metal design, weldments, all kinds of things. So you can see all the different things of SOLIDWORKS. I've done like the first one, uh, I haven't really got past that yet, but then also that's, at the same time, I've been looking for external ones or YouTube or... Right, and there's a ton of stuff on YouTube, but it's kind of like that GrabCAD thing. It depends on who's doing it. And does the guy know what he's talking about? Um, if you go to go slash X mechanical, that's my group. Um, we have a training and tutorial page. Hey, look, you can sign up for this class. Um, that'll be refreshed when I get some new classes on there. But it's got all of my past ones. Um, this year I've started doing shorter versions that are like 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, these other ones, these can go hour and a half to two hours. They go in a real deep dive. If you wanna know how to do surfacing, if you wanna know how to do master modeling, plastic parts, jigs and features, probably 75% of these are me doing them. But I also, like I'm not an, an, an analyst. So for these um, simulation ones, I brought in analysts to go over the stuff with us. So we'll bring in guest speakers and those are all stored here. This class is gonna be on there as well. Yeah, any other questions? Do you have any recommendations on bringing in like gigantic external assemblies and how to like simplify importing that? So, that's a uh, so the question was bringing in an, an, a, a large assembly. You're talking about like, uh, Right, and you can do that. That that that's the first start is from your, uh, from your the the desk the the one that's generating it. You want them to give you an external file, or SolidWorks can open a lot of different file types. It depends. Uh, Pro E not so much, but um, some other ones uh, it can open up. But when you open up the an assembly, if it's come across as like a step file or something like that. Come on, give me my option. Um, when I go to open a file in SolidWorks, here's all the translators I have. So like I said, like Solid Edge and Inventor and Unigraphics, some of them will come in just native. Um, they don't have a feature manager tree, but it brings in the model from that. You don't have to have an intermediate step, but you also have the IGES and step. Step always. I just is surface based, and if the surfaces don't match up, they have a little hole in them or something like that, it won't turn it into a solid. And then you have like a mix of solid and surfaces, and it's a big mess. Uh, so, step file is a solid file to begin with. So, that's the one I typically bring in. Uh, before I bring it in, I'll hit this options. And this goes for any of those files. If you're bringing in an assembly, like a PCB board or some drive or something like that, that's got just a ton of parts in it. Um, it's going to have options for you. Um, that one is on by default. This one is on by default. Please turn them off. <laughs> what the, what 3d interconnect does is it makes it so you don't need to translate. So you can drop a inventor file right into your SOLIDWORKS assembly 
and it links to the inventor file. And if the people send you a new inventor file, you just drop it over the top of it, and then you've got their new design. So there's no translation involved. However, it gives you one of those external references I was talking about, where it's always referencing that I just or that I just file that you got sent in. So I turn that one off always. And then there's this one, import multiple bodies as parts. If you do that, it's gonna bring it in as an assembly with a zillion parts. If you have it turned off, it's gonna bring it in as a part with a zillion solid bodies. That's typically how I'll roll. And then um, you can go in, you can just delete the body. They'll have like a list of bodies. You can just grab those bodies and delete the ones you don't want. Like that happens to me a lot here with PCB boards. Well, they'll give me the whole thing with traces and resistors. I don't need all that information. I just need where the connectors are and where the highest pieces are. Um, so I'll simplify it down to that and then and then save it out as a SOLIDWORKS file. Is there some sort of like shrink wrap tool or some way that you can import? Okay, so his question was, is there a shrink wrap tool, which is a, a Pro-E, who was the one who invented shrink wrap, and theirs works really good. Um, SOLIDWORKS has one does not work as good. Um, the thing is, is that um, I can, it's called a speed pack. So you create a configuration. Um, okay, so I create a configuration. and I can right click on it and create a speed pack. And what speed pack allows you to do is you can pick what faces or what components you want to have real geometry to. What that allows you to do is these are faces that you can make to or that you can dimension to. The rest of the stuff is all gonna be like a phantom. You can see the visuals of it, but there isn't a face to pick. And so it's really light because it's just, Graphics, it doesn't load in all the parametrics that you have in a typical part. The reason I say it's not so good is because we started using this uh, extensively. Um, come on. A second. We started using this extensively uh, at X, but there's a problem with EPDM. I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's a data manager that comes with SOLIDWORKS. It basically reigns in the insanity of a collaborative environment. Only one person can work on a part at a time. It automatically increments revisions, things like that. That tool hates this because it'll if it grabs a shrink wrap, it'll say, I can't find all the parts that are supposed to be in here. And it won't give you the thing that you needed. Another reason I don't use it often is it just crashed my SOLIDWORKS. Um, so yeah, if you don't use PDM and you don't crash, <laughs> um, you can use that. that. That's a tool that some people use. But like I said, we ran into so many issues that just like configurations, it's like, that's cool, but it's more trouble than it's worth for us. Be like a, the ECBA example, you go through physically suppress or remove parts you don't want. Right, I delete the bodies completely yeah. just, just, just to relieve that top heavy uh, geometry. It does a lot of things for me because it, 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 it makes it faster to load the file. Remember when I said you open an assembly, it loads all the files? Well, if the file is 32 megabytes, that one's going to take a little longer to get into your RAM. Also, if you've got a bunch of those, your RAM starts filling up, and now your machine's running low. So there's just the open time that's going to be affected by the amount of geometry that you have in there. And then once you get it open, trying to, to rotate it and stuff, can your graphics card hang with the amount of geometry you're trying to show? at one time. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, give it a shot. Um, it's OK. It's, it's just a configuration. So if you load a speed pack configuration in there, when you open the top level assembly, if they're all speed packs, it opens like nothing. Um, there's also something called large design review. Um, but we're starting to go down a rabbit hole because I can actually talk for about four days. That's how much time is on those uh, movies I just showed you. On any topic, I can just keep talking on SOLIDWORKS. So at some point, uh, we're either going to have to take it offline or if you'd like to, to ask me afterwards, that's fine. Anybody else got any question? Anyone online still out there? 
Okay, then, um, like I said, this will be posted within the next couple of days. I'll give you guys all a link if you want to watch it again, or for people that didn't make it, um, they can watch it. Thanks for coming.